from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. One of the type of programs that we do from time to time is to invite an author of a book to discuss that particular publication, and we're very happy to introduce one of those programs today. I welcome to the program Art Norlin, who is from the state of Idaho, and we had him on our program years ago when he had authored a book, and he has returned with his latest book uh, that I would like to show all of you, and uh, it is entitled uh, Death of a Proud Union, the 1960 Bunker Hill Strike. Uh, this particular book uh, is about uh, the mines in Kellogg, and uh, uh, our guest uh, has had a great experience uh, with the mines over the years, and I would like to read from the cover of the book that says, Art Norland narrates and comments on the final 25 years in the history of this proud union. He shares his views as a former officer in the Kellogg local, and later as a well-informed and interested observer. This is an account of mine mill by one of the men from the Shafts. Uh, it's a very, very, I think, good introduction to the book, and Art, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. We look forward to going back in history uh, to talk about mining in North Idaho and your latest book, and congratulations on its publication. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'm very happy, as always, to have Janelle Burke, one of our regular panelists, to join with me in uh, reviewing uh, this book with our guest, and I shall ask Janelle to commence the questioning. We're going to talk today about one of my very favorite spots in the whole world. It's beautiful and it's also fascinating history up there, very colorful. Can you tell us what it was like uh, in Kellogg, uh, in the Silver Valley itself, uh, about the time that these events were happening? What, what was it like? Well, it was uh, nothing like it is right now. Uh, since this, they have had the tree planting program on for to beautify the surrounding hills. And uh, of course the freeway is new through there and uh, there's a, quite a few, uh, I guess they call it, they have a name for them, those buildings that uh, the German type. Bavarian buildings. Bavarian buildings, that's what they are, yes. And uh, it's, uh, it was anything but a beautiful place. In but what was the atmosphere like? When I got what was the atmosphere like? Were there lots of people there, and it very exciting, I suppose? Yeah, it was that. Uh, now that you're not speaking of the atmosphere, including the air. Yes. But the atmosphere, the people has always been that way. They had uh, well, the dances. There was all kinds of doings in Kellogg. There was never any slack time. And uh, Wardner was another place right above Kellogg. Uh, something was going on there all the time. The schoolhouse, they held meetings of all kinds up there, and games. And there was foot races up the hill. They used to race up to Kellogg Peak, where the gondola takes tourists now. There's a trail up there, and they had races. And I was, I, I've known I never did see one because this happened when I was still in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, but uh, I, I know a lot of the champions that made that three-mile run up that hill. It was tough. It's steep, really. You, you go from uh, 2,200 feet to 6,400 feet in, in, uh, in, a, in a rise of elevation. In so, the early days, what was business like in Kellogg? Well, uh, <clears throat> the earliest I can tell you anything about business was from 1950 on. Yes. Uh, I was never in business in Kellogg until 1950. And I stayed in business until 1974. And I lacked just uh, about, I think I figured, 13 weeks of being there a quarter of a century in business. And it was a golden place for business. It was good. Art, let's, uh, let's move into the, the book itself because we introduced that we were going to deal with, with this book. And uh, my first question is going to deal with um, 
a very obvious one that authors are asked all the time, why did you decide to write the book? Well, that is a good question, and <laughs> I was in a quandary for a long time whether to write it or whether I shouldn't. I could see seven months of history going nowhere and never be a record of it unless somebody did something about it. And I'd say for the, about the last two decades, I've been wondering why nobody wrote a book about that. So <clears throat> I was invited to a party. It's the 50th anniversary of one of the mining families up there. And somebody got to talking. They'd read my book, The Vanishing Immigrants, and uh, they had history in mind, too. And they said, why don't you write a book about the 1960 strike? Oh, I says, it's too involved. I says, I can't do it. Oh, we'll help you, we'll help you. And they kind of pushed me around, and I, I got to thinking seriously about it. This was in 1990. So <clears throat> after about a month of thinking about it, I finally began asking questions about it. And of course, I figured it was as simple as falling off of a horse, you know, to go out and get interviews. But it didn't turn out that way. Always a lot more work than you think. <laughs> Let, let's get into some of the, the substance of the book itself. Uh, in the book, you go back and you do a chronology of different events that, hap uh, that happened to the mining industry in yeah. Shoshone mm -hmm. County, uh, even before the 1990s strike. Can you take a minute to tell us what some of those most crucial and important times. I know the focus of this book is the 1960 strike, but mm -hmm. before we get into that, let's go back and talk about uh, what were some of the other strikes or events that you think were crucial yeah. in the history of the mining industry? Well, the Sunshine Strike was really a crucial. And what, when, when was that? That was 1937. Uh, the union had, the union was destroyed up there, well, right after the turn of the century. And there was only pieces of unions operating in there. But so you're also, saying at that time then the industry, the owners were dominant, the workers just had right, got whatever they right, offered. That's, that's right, yes. Okay, excuse me. Just go and ahead. The, uh, uh, I think what would interest you most was how that strike was organized and how it happened. And it's quite a long story, but I'll make it as short as I can. The, Sunshine miners were organized. They had a union in the Sunshine Mine, but it, it was not recognized by the company. They had, did not have union recognition. So a guy, my McGuire, international representative for Mine Mill, and uh, John Powers, he was a Spokane, and he, he was in charge of Area 9, which included Kellogg. Those two went and organized the miners to where they thought, well, they got enough of them signed up, and uh, inflation was growing at that time. They, they, they felt that they needed more money than, than they put in for union recognition and a money program and also a steward program. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they pulled the strike on a Monday uh, it's uh, right on, when you pass the uh, sign there, lead, road leading up Big Creek, that leads, leads up to the mine mill, or to the mine buildings. Uh, the mine mill setup was right on the, on the triangle there where the road takes off, and it covered about a half acre. And it, uh, the, he said, uh, the, guy, the guy that finally set me straight on all this, he, he said that they had about 200 people that Monday morning. And uh, nobody went to work. <clears throat> and uh, they stopped everything, of course. Uh, and uh, as, as it was, the company wouldn't give and this was after the Wagner Act. They wouldn't give in, and uh, in a couple of days they found out the 
guys found out that were on strike that they had been fired. All those that appeared on the scene the first morning were fired. And uh, <clears throat> it went on. And I remember once when I had furlough, I was in the service at that time. Uh, I joined, joined the service after Pearl Harbor, by the way. Once I, I was out on furlough, the only one furlough that I was able to spend at home, and my home at that time was Coeur d'Alene. But I drove up to Kellogg. I had a lot of friends up there. and Here was a yard full of parked car all around the Union Hall. So I got to wondering what in the world is going in. I'm going to interrupt because our time is short. We, we're going to have to go to, I want to come back to this. Uh, Janelle has some questions and come back to the 60s strike. But tell us what was the end result of that strike. Did, did they get rehired or did the... Uh, yeah, did that's, that's just what I mm -hmm. was going to... At that meeting, they had gained their uh, back pay, it was called. Okay. And the guy that I got the most information out of was blackballed up there, and he could not get a job, and he drew the full amount of $4,500 back pay. And uh, uh, relative to Ruth out there, Ruth Husa, he, he got this one of the smallest, but those are the only two I found out about. He got 1500 But he got picked up jobs as it was. They only paid for time lost in that period. But they all went back to work yeah. and got their back pay. And uh, the, it was a celebration of winning the okay. back pay. The court had just right. awarded them. And That's what the thing was and about. And so this particular strike was, was, it, it was a great breakthrough for our unions, was it not? And they were stronger after this. Oh, it this. was. It was, yes. Yeah. It was. Janelle Burke. Let's get into the 1960 Bunker Hill strike. Uh, that was at the Bunker Hill mine. Was yes. it physically at the Bunker Hill mine? Yes, it was. And, and what did they intend to accomplish with the 1960 strike? What were the miners trying to accomplish? They were, they were trying at that time again. Uh, it seemed like pay was awfully good up there, but it took a little more than if you lived in Coeur d'Alene to live in Kellogg and up there. And they wanted a 22 cents increase. Do you recall what they were being paid per hour at that time? Uh, they were, they were, the wages at that time was, I don't remember the hourly wage, but... Uh, but they wanted a 22 percent, a, two, a 22 yeah. cent increase. They were, they were getting about 11 something a day. And they, they wanted, uh, for the whole Three years, it would amount to, to amount to thirty cents an hour increase, and uh, the company offered them fifteen, and stood on that, and they wouldn't wouldn't budge on that. That was the beginning, and the the union went on strike. And uh, now people claim that that's what the company wanted was a strike, because they wanted to break the union. That's that's what people are thinking today. That is not my thinking at all, but then that's what, that's what the talk is in Kellogg and the Silver Valley. Now, at that time, when that happened, uh, were there other things that they were seeking also, such as benefits or, or uh, safety yes. precautions? There were other aspects to There's the always that in a strike. The, all the things that uh, have failed by grievances and negotiations, they're all brought up when they have a strike. So I imagine there was, yes, I know there was a lot of... Lot of uh, Other issues. Yeah, there's health issues, there was uh, hospitalization, and there was a lot of issues like that involved besides the wage issue and, uh, and the union recognition. Well, the union recogni recognition they had at that time. Now, a strike at that point would have been a a not coming to work kind of strike. Were there That's picket right. lines as well? It was. They had uh, they had two campers that was donated to the union or loaned. I don't know if it was donated or loaned to the union for the duration, and it was placed in different places. And where they didn't have a camper to, for the pickets to stay in, if it started raining or something, why they set up tents, and uh, they had regular. Uh, they had picket captains for every property. Now, when I say every property, there was a zinc plant, a smelter, the mine, 
the uh, repair So they all shop. went out? Yeah, they all every, went out. Everything was out, but those were different plants. See? And there was a different picket captain for each one of them. And he had to choose pickets and see that there was always a set of pickets on the job. And uh, uh, after, after that strike happened, the rest, uh, ASNR, American, American Smelting and Refining, went on strike. And that brought, brought on a bigger, that was about somewhere around 900 people altogether added to the Bunker Hill 1700. So it, it was really a dead place over there. And uh, the fight between the union and the, and the uh, alternate union, the one that tackled and challenged mine mill, they called themselves the uh, Northwest Metal Workers. That started in about September after that strike. And they introduced their program for, for uh, uh, doing away with mine mill. And the whole community turned in with them. Uh, well, the, well, even the, the education people turned in with them, like the school board, the chamber of commerce, the merchants, the churches. So what you're saying is everybody took sides here. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Well, it was very one-sided. And that brings up something else. There were six of us businessmen that absolutely refused. We stayed neutral. We didn't, didn't want to go with one side or the other. And that made it bad for us, of course. Uh, and there was also the same amount of bartenders. There was actually 12 of us, that, uh, uh, six businessmen and six bartenders that stayed neutral. And the rest of them, uh, I, don't, I don't know of any business that joined in with Mine Mill. They all joined in with uh, Northwest Metal Workers. And uh, <clears throat> it went on, and of course the book tells, shows about all the things you see in the book were full page ads, and they've been reduced down to book size. The, what was the date in 1960 if the strike first happened? Was it uh, the, the exact date in 1960 when, the, when they went on strike? Uh, well, the fifth, the, the strike was declared on the sixth, the, was the stoppage, on sixth, the sixth of May. Sixth of May. Now, as the strike lingered on, uh, you were indicating that the, much of the community in Shoshone County went against the mine mill. And uh, what was the end result of uh, what happened to mine mill and, 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 uh, and who went back to work? <clears throat> They had, the election started to take shape about the 1st of December, and the election was held on the 10th. To decide what union would be involved. Yeah, that's right. There was a, was a yes or no there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was 1,560 workers voted, and the Northwest beat Mine Mill by 51 vote. That close. Yeah, that's that close. Yeah. Then that was really the death of Mine Mill, wasn't it? That was the, that was the death blow to mine. Okay. Right, yeah. When the Northwest organization took over and went in, what did, the, did when they went back to work? Did they did they get any uh, raise and uh, what happened? No, they settled for what the company had offered. Okay. But uh, I really don't know. Uh, there was a lot of kick about the union, and they lost out in the next election. The lost Northwest. Out, yeah, they lost out to the steel workers in the mm -hmm. next election. And uh, <clears throat> now the steel workers, of course, they they just died out practically, along with the with the bad silver prices and, and the shutdowns of mines and stuff like that. There's only a few men working up in that district. Let, let's take another period here. You, you've you've been very clear on that that one union took another one's place, and things were. Mm -hmm. They didn't, they didn't weren't sound like as aggressive as the mine mill had been. And then there was a period, of course, when prices were good and there was an awful lot of people working. Actually, many thousands were working in the mines throughout Shoshone County. Uh, and then we know in more recent history, because of the price and so forth and, and mines mm -hmm. closing, no matter what union had been there, there those jobs have been lost. But from the time that the Northwest Group took over until some years later when the prices went down, 
well, how were unions and workers different after this great battle that took place? Were unions, even before while the prices were good, were unions as strong or did they take a different approach? No, it, everything, the union talk stopped practically. Uh, before that, uh, miners would come in. Of course, I knew the miners. I'd worked with them 20 years before that, and, and I knew most of them. Because you'd been an officer in the union yourself, hadn't you? Yeah, I, I belonged to the same union. In fact, I was the recording secretary for Ryan mm -hmm. Miller at one time. And that was right after I came out of the service. Mm -hmm. But I was well known in the district, and I came out of the service. And, uh, the second Second meeting I attended, the, uh, the uh, recording secretary had quit. But then, the with your experience in that and then being in business there, uh, how was it so different when people quit talking and being so, that they became less pro-union, uh, the workers themselves? No, not, not really. Uh, it, it sounded before the strike that there was a lot of, to me, this, this now, that, that's different from other people because I was, I was once one of them. And they come in there and uh, they always talked union to me over the counter, you know. Uh, but uh, that stopped after the election, after the mine mill uh, lost out. And uh, I don't know, it was just uh, sort of a, a slack uh, time for unionism turned up in Kellogg. There was nothing done here, nothing done there. The, they got a five-year contract, which was very unusual. And uh, the, the, uh, the strike was over a three-year contract. They wanted a three-year contract, but the Northwest adopted the company's uh, proposition for a five-year contract. And I guess they had certain uh, uh, wages depended to some extent on silver prices. If the silver price went up for, for six months, then they, they were entitled to a pay raise. And if it went down, they, were, they had to take a pay cut. Mm -hmm. So it was fluctu fluctuate, fluctuating pay is what it amounted to. So your book indicates that, you know, that vote was very close. You said 51 votes, but if uh, a lot of things in life are determined by such things as uh, a, a close vote. Yeah. And so if it had gone the other way, how do you think it, life would have been different in Shoshone County if the mine mill had won? I don't know. I, I, I think it would have gone on. Uh, I think it would have been a little livelier in the, as far as the labor group was concerned. But I don't think it would have made much difference. Okay. Janelle Burke. If a miner was out on strike, what happened to his family? How was he taken care of? Um, yeah. What that's was a, life like for that family? That's another good question. They had the commissary, the mine mill did, and of course only members in good standing could use that. And it's, it's an interview in the book with uh, Schultz. He was the foreman on that well, on the whole relief pro program by the union. And uh, the uh, Northwest started the same thing after they got strong enough to do it. And then the churches started. And uh, you'll read in there about the double dippers and triple dippers. Uh, they'd uh, hide their union membership in the Northwest They'd go to mine mill and get their rations, and they'd get more from Northwest, and then go to the churches and get some. So that happened, actually happened, and it's in there. So a, a miner's family was sort of on, uh, the miner and his family were sort of on their own resources. And they, they, they were, yes, and a lot of them suffered. During that period of time. A lot of them suffered because some of them quit mine mill. And of course, if you were not a member in good standing, you couldn't get any relief. See? And uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars of support Mine Mill got from other unions, but they got a tremendous amount of money. And uh, I counted up to 160,000. But I, I, even the international representatives don't remember, they can't, 
say just exactly how much the union got. And uh, one, one man who was a treasurer for local 18 is dead. I couldn't talk to him. <clears throat> and so there were structures, though. So management people were not included in the union, of course. No, of course not. And, and there, were there, there was a definite division, I suppose, in the community between management people and union people. Would That's that right. have been a there correct a uh, assumption? There. There were, they, they were. So not only were there fights between the unions, but there were also fights between the management and the, and, and the union people. That's right. Well, there was, there was trouble between management and management. Yes. And uh, there was a constant trouble between management and labor because management was mostly against the strike. There was a few of them that thought it was okay because men weren't getting a fair shake, but I'd say 80% oh, of them was against the strike of, of management. And at that time, at the, 19, at the time of the 1990s or 1960 strike, would top management have been living in Kellogg? actually living there. Later on, some of the top management of mines, as the ownership shifted to other companies, were no longer located personally in Kellogg. Yeah. But at the time of this strike, were the top management people located in Kellogg they were, physically yes. there? Yes, they were. Yeah. They, they stayed right there. I talked to the president of the Bunker Hill Company just about once a week. I run into him and have a long talk with him. And uh, it, it, it was, uh, there, there wasn't actually, nothing made any difference ex except the merchants didn't have anybody to get money from. To, uh, to buy things. No, yeah, that's right. They, they couldn't sell, sell their merchandise. A lot of them were overstocked and there was all kinds of sales. and. Most of the merchandise that was sold there was sold to outsiders. People from Coeur d'Alene come up there and bought some of those sales, uh, sales items. With that, I have to bring our program to conclusion. I have received word that we're out of time. And uh, Art, uh, thank you very much for being with us and discussing your book. And I know our viewers are aware that we only got a small portion of the book uh, mm -hmm. in in the 30 minutes. But thank you very much, and Janelle, for your very fine questions. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Art Norlin, who is the author of his most recent book entitled Death of a Proud Union, the 1960 Bunker Hill Strike. Uh, he's been discussing with us uh, what happened to unions in Shoshone County, which is one of the areas in the Northwest that was most active in mining for many years. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed our program and that you will be with us again next week at this same time when we will discuss an important issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.